Welcome to the Senate Government Affairs on Friday afternoon at 3.30. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, if the Secretary will please take the roll. Vice Chair Arnshaw. Here. Senator Gokachia. Yes. Senator Neal. Here. Senator Hansen. Chair Don Deraloop. Here, and please mark uh, Senator Hansen uh, absent. Thank you very much. And uh, just a brief reminder that uh, for those of you that are joining us on Zoom, uh, if you need any assistance uh, when you get ready to uh, chime in uh, in support, opposition, or public ter testimony, you'll hear uh, information to do that. So uh, we'll have a period of public comment at the end. And reminder, uh, two minutes for each speaker, and it can be on anything but the bills that we heard in committee. Today, the committee will be hearing four bills, AB 21, AB 28, AB 71, and a Assembly Bill 153. We're going to take these slightly out of order. We're gonna start with Assembly Bill 153 um, with our very own Assemblywoman, uh, Bill Bray Axelrod. We are so happy to have you here with us. Thank you for accommodating our late afternoon meeting. And when you're ready, please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Dondero Loop, Vice Chair Orenshaw, members of the Senate Government Affairs Committee. Happy to be here. I'm Assemblywoman Shannon Bilbury Axelrod, representing Assembly District 34 and I'm honored to present Assembly Bill 153 to the committee for your consideration today. I am joined via Zoom by Tim Farkas, who represents Moresco, who will provide additional technical information regarding the legislation. Assembly Bill 153 pro proposes meaningful policy reform that will encourage Nevada state and local agencies to maximize the benefit of energy saving performance contracts and directly support a key component of Governor Sisolak's Climate Action Initiative, which calls for the expansions of ESPCs to support greenhouse gas emission reductions, achieve sustainability goals, and promote, promote energy efficient measures. So let me explain what performance contracting is. Performance contracting is an alternative funding source, a way to make operating cost savings improvements now without tapping into capital budgets. The result cost savings pays for itself over time. The agency benefits immediately by getting new equipment and expertise from an energy service professional, ongoing maintenance, and the ability to accomplish many projects all at once. A using agency enters into agreement with an energy service company, also called an ESCO. The ESCO will identify and evaluate savings opportunities and then recommend a package of improvements to be paid for through the utility and operation savings. Many types of building improvements can be funded through existing budgets, new lighting technologies, boilers, chillers, energy management controls, landscaping irrigation systems, trash compactions, just to, make, trash compaction, just to name a few. Performance contracts allow agencies to make the facility upgrades now with no upfront capital and pay with them over time through the utility and operational savings that results. While contract payments occur during the useful lifeness of the asset, if the savings aren't available to make the payments over time, then the benefit of the performance contract is reduced. The ongoing benefits of the project don't change. The company performing the work isn't hurt by the agency, but, is, but the agency is not getting the full benefit. AB 153 allows the savings to be put back into the payment of the cost saving project. There are three sections of AB 153. Section one, the bill clarifies that local government may use savings realized from a performance contract to make any payment required to, under the performance contract, including finance charges. Section two includes a legislative declaration that is the state's policy to encourage state agency to the extent practical to utilize statutory provisions govern it, governing performance contracts to implement efficiency measures to reduce energy, water use costs, and related expenses. 
And section three of this bill authorizes a state agency as part of the biennium budget preparation process to request the reinvestment of savings realized under the performance contract. We have also requested a minor, minor technical change in this bill um, that was in the first house um, using the term labor cost. It was a concern that was raised in the first house and actually um, we lost three uh, votes because of it. So we're happy to remove that and I think it would have been unanimous if we would have been able to remove that on the other side. The technical change to AB um, 153 explicitly articulates state policy encouraging the utilization of performance contracts to implement energy efficiency and cost saving measures. The change will provide clear statutory guidance to state agencies regarding the state's commitment to perform contracting and encourage the utilization of this important budget neutral efficiency tool. It also clarifies permissible usage of savings realized under performance contracts and allows local governments to use such savings to make payments towards the finance cost of the performance contract. This change will further promote performance contracting and energy efficient implementation among local government, governments. With the approval of the chair, I'll now turn this over to Tim Farkas to provide some additional testimony on the legislation. Thank you very much and go ahead, Mr. Farkas, when you're ready. Thank you, Chairperson, and, and thank you, uh, Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod. That was a, an excellent summary. Um, I'm joining you today from Las Vegas, uh, and I, I live here, I'm from here. Uh, I've been doing this kind of work uh, for 11 years directly. Before that, I was a public finance banker. And what Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod described is, is an important distinction. This is really a sort of a financing tool. And so it was brought to our attention uh, several months ago, maybe a year ago, that the, the statute pertaining to state agencies didn't really have language explaining what can be done with the utility and operational savings of uh, the work that we do. And so without that language, it wasn't clear that they could keep the savings to make associated payments for the project, which is basically the premise of the whole statute and um, the work that we do in our industry. So in, in seeking to kind of clarify and, and rectify the statute, we also decided that it would be better if we made the language in 332 for local governments a little bit more clear as well. And so that's the sort of impetus of this, uh, this legislative change. I would maybe describe it as really a, a clarification and adding language that, that probably should have been there from the beginning. Um, and so I, I hope that's clear. It's, it's a great program. Many local governments have utilized 332 and, and the work that we do, and, uh, and less so state agencies under 33A because of that lack of, of clarifying language. Um, I really appreciate your attention to this. I'd be happy to address any questions. Thank you very much. And questions, committee? Uh, Senator Neal. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I just had a quick question on um, the the way the performance um, contracting works for the labor related labor costs. So in real life, what what are the expectations for um, the entities to um, do the performance base for the labor cost? I mean, I, I, I'm not clear on like what you want them to do, like reduce wages, limit hours. What are we doing with that? Thank you, Senator Neal. And the amendment actually removes that term altogether. I think it's just on Nellis now. So thank you for, for bringing that up. And that was specifically what I was referring to. That was not the intent. It was just um, language that was used throughout NRS and basically, you know, put in there, but we, that we in no way, shape, or form uh, want uh, that to be in there. So happy to remove it. Thank you very much. Additional questions? Yes, Senator Gokachia. Uh, mine was right along the same lines, I'd, but it's the understanding then that in this bill, on this side then, uh, that term related labor cost will be amended out. That is correct. Shannon Bilbury-Axwad for the record. That is correct. Thank you. 
And I will ask a question. So can you, um, can you give me, I always like to hear sort of real life uh, examples of what we're doing. So in section two, where it says reduce costs related to energy, water, or the disposal of waste, um, can you sort of give me a, a real life example there? Shannon Bill Braxwad for the record, yeah. and I will turn this over to Tim Farkas, but I, I did want to, one that came up, and I don't know if they plan on testifying in support on this side, but we did hear from the city of Henderson on the other side that they used a performance contract because the language was unclear. Some people were using it, some weren't, and they did a um, solar lighting path on a path in Henderson. So we're able to use that realization of the power savings from the lighting um, uh, with a performance contract, but I th believe Mr. Farkas has several um, real life examples if you want to give quickly just, one or two. Just w one's good <laughs> enough. And Mr. Farkas, would you please state your name for the record when you start? Thank you. Certainly. This is Tim Farkas for the record. And the city of Henderson did a very successful project about 10 years ago that included streetlights and uh, air conditioning equipment. And the utility savings uh, is used to then pay for the costs of the improvements. And so that's that's kind of the premise. Take the existing utility budget, reduce it because the equipment is more efficient. The new equipment is so much more efficient that it then pays for the costs of installing uh, the, the new equipment. And and, um, and they did a very successful project. They're very happy with it. They're, they're in the last few years of a of a 15 year agreement, and um, there are many many more examples, but that one in particular stands out because it was a citywide effort, and they won an award by, uh, from the Association of uh, Energy Engineers for the streetlight part of the project, which was very successful. Thank you. Perfect. That's what I wanted to hear. I appreciate that. Any additional questions, uh, Senator Neal? Thank you, Madam Chair. So on the disposal of the waste, since we're talking about cities, so what if one of the cities, because I know, I think I think they do, um, they have like a 500-year contract on their disposal. Like, it's in perpetuity. I mean, would they now have to go back and rethink their disposal waste contract? Shannon Bilberry, for, for, for the record. Go ahead, Tim. For the record, Tim Farkas, um, no, the, the scope is determined by the, by the municipal entity. Um, if they don't, they're never required to do anything, but the type of waste management reduction that we might do is, is something more simple like trash compaction and having the uh, trash company only come out when the trash bin is full. Um, we don't get involved in uh, affecting the uh, the actual uh, amount of waste that gets sent to the landfill that that's a that's a different um, th that's beyond our scope and we may help with some recycling here and there but really it's it's a simpler uh, effort than that more more direct and in, in, uh, uh, location specific site site spe site specific you might say thanks madam chair thank you very much additional questions. Okay, seeing none, we'll go to uh, our support, opposition, and neutral uh, line um, broadcasting. When you're ready, go to the support, please. To testify in support of Assembly Bill 153, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christy Cabrera, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-C-A-B-R-E-R-A, -E -E, and I'm the Policy and Advocacy Director for the Nevada Conservation League here in support of AB 153. Performance contracting is an opportunity for governments to make energy efficiency upgrades that reduce energy costs and associated pollution. This bill will make it easier for governments to engage in these type of contracts. Energy efficiency is the cheapest and fastest way to meet our growing energy demand 
while reducing the pollution that drives climate change and harms our health because the cheapest energy source is the one you don't have to produce in the first place. Energy efficiency is also critical to meeting our state's climate goals. We urge your support on AB 153. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next caller, please. Caller, with the last three digits of 848, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, David Dazlich, D-A-Z-L-I-C-H, Director of Government Affairs with the Vegas Chamber. We would just like to offer our voices in support of this measure and thank the sponsor. We believe this is a good, efficient budgetary measure that local governments can use and have used effectively, and we would urge your support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next caller, please. Chair, there are no more callers in support at this time. Thank you very much. We'll move to opposition. Three, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you very much. We'll go to neutral. To testify in the neutral position on Assembly Bill 153, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in the neutral position at this time. Thank you very, very much. And we'll go back to Assemblywoman uh, Bilberry Axelrod. Do you have any closing comments? Um, uh, thank you very much, committee, for hearing this bill. I would like to um, point out on Nellis, you will see a letter of support from the uh, Governor's Office of Energy. Um, we had a few more people calling it in support, but I guess that's just the nature of Friday afternoon, right? <laughs> so um, thank you, and I, like I said, with the amendment that um, we were proposing, I, I think this would have been unanimous coming out of the assembly. We lost three people, but I look forward. So it's a, a good thing to help um, help the earth. <laughs> so thank you, and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, you as well. We're sort of fast and furious around here in government affairs. We're efficient. So thank you very much for joining us. Enjoy your weekend. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, we will, that closes the hearing on Assembly Bill 153. And we'll jump back to the beginning of the agenda. And we will go to Assembly Bill 21. Um, and, oh, there's, okay, hello. You are there and you are ready. Great. Um, Assembly Bill 21, hang on just a minute, I'm getting my papers under control as well. It revises provisions governing the confidentiality of personal information of certain persons. And uh, Mandy Davis, um, please go ahead when you're ready. Great, thank you so much. Good afternoon, my name is Mandy Davis, Deputy Administrator for the Division of Child and Family Services. Thank you for allowing us to present Assembly Bill 21 this afternoon. Um, this bill will change some of the requirements for members of our confidential address program to request that their information re remain confidential um, through certain governmental entities. I'll turn it over to Erica Pond um, to present a brief overview of our confidential address program. She is our supervisor of our victim services programs, and then I will go briefly through a description of the changes that the bill proposes. Good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity to present this overview of the confidential address program. My name is Erica Pond and I'm the Victim Services Supervisor at the Division of Child and Family Services. I oversee the federal and state victim service grants that are administered by DCFS. I also oversee the Victims of Crime Compensation Program and the Confidential Address Program. The Confidential Address Program is known as the CAP Program, and it functions to assist victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, or stalking from being located by the perpetrator through public records. 
Once an applicant to the CAP program is approved, that participant, along with any family members that reside with the participant, are provided with a fictitious address and a confidential mail forwarding address. DCFS CAP staff um, receive and forward mail to CAP participants. In terms of volume, currently there are 1,467 participants in the program. Since 2017, the program size has increased by 200 to 400 participants per year. On average, 26 new applications are processed monthly and upwards of 18,000 pieces of mail are processed annually with around 1,500 pieces of mail processed monthly. The CAP program was established by the legislature in 1997 and began accepting participants in 1998. The CAP program originally operated out of the Secretary of State's office, followed by the Attorney General's office, before it was transferred to DCFS in 2017. To apply to the CAP program, potential applicants must apply through a certified advocate that is staffed at a domestic violence agency, which can be either a nonprofit or a local government organization. And a complete list of the agencies across Nevada is available on our DCFS CAP website, with also a link by county, so any applicant can click on their respective county to view the agencies in their area. The applicant must have specific evidence to indicate that they're a victim of domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, or stalking. And an example would be a copy of a police report, a record of a conviction, a temporary restraining order, or some other protective order. And once that information is verified by the certified advocate, that application is submitted to DCFS for review. CAP participants have protected voter registration records. They're exempted from jury duty. They have a confidential address for public school zoning, utility services, and the Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, and so that concludes my CAP overview presentation. So I'd like to thank you for this opportunity and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for that information. Uh, questions from the committee? Senator Neal. Thank you. Um, so I know on the other hearing, on the other side, Dave Dolly um, submitted an opposition letter. So is that still, is he still in opposition? Um, thank you, Mandy Davis, for the record. I'm not sure if he's on the call today. Um, I was going to go over a brief overview of the bill, but um, we did amend this bill when it was in the assembly to include some extra checks and balances that uh, Mr. Dolly had requested to, so that a participant would have to submit additional documentation to verify they are a participant in the program. Um, and then there's also the opportunity where a county assessor or county recorder's office can contact us directly just to verify uh, so that uh, nobody would have the opportunity to submit a fraudulent um, application to have their information kept confidential. And then quick follow-up, Madam Chair. What's the number of individuals that are probably going to use this fictitious address? I mean, because when I was reading the bill, crossovers, you know, crosses over to voting, um, it crosses over to the DMV, and, you know, I'm just wondering, I get the safety concern that's being addressed, but it crosses over into several categories. So how many are going, is this going to apply to? Uh, thank estimate? you for the question, Mandy Davis, for the record. Um, currently, we have 1,467 participants in the program. Um, not all of them would uh, would apply for the changes that are proposed in this bill. Um, it, Section 1 would allow a participant of the Confidential Address Program to submit a sworn affidavit to a county assessor's office. Um, to a county recorder's office, excuse me, to request that their home address information remain confidential. So only those participants where they are purchasing a home or purchasing property where their uh, actual physical address would be made available on the county assessors or county recorder's websites are the ones that this bill, the sections one through four would apply to. Um, currently, we estimate about it, the number of actual individuals who purchase a home who are enrolled in this program is very small. Um, I believe we've had less than 10 try to try to use the provisions that um, this that we're seeking to allow for this allow them to have their information remain confidential through this bill. Um, 
it has been very small. So we estimate um, less than 20, maybe up to 50 over the next several years. But the actual number of individuals who are homeowners or seek to purchase a home while they're enrolled in this program is actually very minimal. Additional questions? Thank you, Madam Chair. So, so there's a couple of things, right? When you when you said that there's a minimal amount of people who will purchase a home, but um, what what are what kinds of conflicts or issues do they run into because of this fictitious address? Because well, there just seems to be a lot of things associated with this like being able to prove your identity, how does this affect their social security, um, how, long, how long do they stay within this program, um, that, those, are, those are just, those are my, those are my initial thoughts that I really want to know. Okay. Um, thank you for the questions. Mandy Davis for the record. If I could just do a brief summary of the changes of the bill. Um, as I said, Section 1 would allow a participant in the program to maintain their, to request that a county recorder maintain their information as confidential. Um, this would allow the individual to submit a sworn affidavit rather than a court order to um, request that their information remain confidential. Um, part of the amendments that were approved in the assembly was that they would also have to submit um, verification in the form of a letter issued by our office and an enrollment card issued by our office to um, prove that they are a member of the program. And then in addition, a county recorder's office can contact us at any time to verify that a sworn affidavit they, they've received is actually from a participant of the program. Um, section two of the bill adds participants of the confidential address program to the list of persons that are allowed to make these types of requests to a county recorder's office. And then sections three and four would uh, include the same changes only for county assessor's offices throughout the state. So they're almost identical, except uh, it applies to the county assessor's offices instead of county recorder's offices. Um, section five adds the secretary of state and city clerks to the entities that shall not make participants confidential address or fictitious address, their telephone number or email address available for inspection um, or copying included in any list that is made av available for public inspection, unless they are directed to do so by a court order. And then finally, section six uh, adds participants of our CAP program to the list of people who may request that the Department of Motor Vehicles display an alternate address on their driver's license, commercial driver's license or identification card. Um, so the, the program itself allows um, participants to provide a generic fictitious address to entities to use as their standard mailing address. Um, our division picks up mail from that fictitious address and then forwards it to their actual physical address. We keep their confidential physical address on file here and act as a mail forwarding service. So it doesn't impact their um, social security number, their social security benefits or anything like that. Um, this bill would just allow those participants to be able to uh, request that their physical address remain confidential um, for county assessors and recorders offices when they choose to purchase a property or if they are current homeowners or property owners. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? So I, I have one. I, I understand everything you're saying, but I one little tweak like so if i'm in an apartment building the apartments all have the same address but unit one unit two right so how does that how would you would their mail would still just go somewhere else seems like it would be different if you didn't own it um actually most of the participants of our program are renters um, they just by the nature of the, the crime, they're trying to get away from their abuser or stalker. Um, so they tend to move around a lot anyway. Um, the, their physical address where they are living, um, where their mail would be delivered, would still be on file in our office. It would remain confidential. We would not allow anybody to have access to it that is not allowed to. Um, 
and then the, the mailing address that they give to their utility companies to have displayed on their driver's license, to use as a mailing address for uh, some deliveries, things like that. They would use a generic fictitious address provide that uh, we go and pick up the mail from and then we forward it to their actual physical address. So, so it just it keeps their physical location where they're living um, out of uh, cert, unable to be searched, so that their stalker or abuser would be make it more difficult for them to find them. Okay, thank you. And then, just as a follow up, how do um, how does someone who needs this um, protection find out about this? Like, what what, what means of communication is that? This is Erica Pond for the record. If someone is in need of the confidential address program, on our DCFS website, we have um, a list of the certified advocates that are available across the state of Nevada and their respective agency in the county that they're located in. And so that potential applicant would go and find, um, they would click their link to their county, they would find an agency with advocates, contact that agency and say that they would like to participate in the CAP program. At that point, the advocate would have them complete an application and assist them in that. And then um, the verification of the, um, th that they are a victim of domestic violence or sexual assault, human trafficking, or stalking would be verified by that certified advocate. And then um, that advocate would submit their application to DCFS on their behalf. And so we utilize the advocates to kind of verify their uh, status as a victim. And then we process their application and then provide them with a verification card and then a, an approval letter in the mail that also specifies their fictitious mailing address. Thank you very much. Senator Bocaccia. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I guess I'm just, maybe I'm trying to simplify it too much, but it seems to me that uh, this only applies at the point you have, uh, you've been issued a fictitious address under 217. Is that not correct? And then if this only, this bill only extends out to what agencies, whether it's a recorder, uh, assessor or whatever, but you have to have already went through the, all, jumped through all the hoops that, uh, the affidavit and whatever, and you've been granted a fictitious address already before this bill kicks in. Is that right? Or am I missing something? This is Erica Pond for the record. So the fictitious address is issued to the participants for the purposes of them receiving their mail. Um, but it, this bill um, is really to limit um, the uh, public record search of information if they become a homeowner. So maybe they're issued the fictitious address, but as soon as they buy a house, that parcel information with their name on the title is um, publicly searchable on both the assessor's website and the recorder's website. So their participation in the camp confidential address program then is um, not useful if their abuser can just search the recorder's site, find their name, their parcel, how much they paid for a house, and all of that information um, just from a Google search. And so what we're really trying to do is keep their um, information confidential, even if they do want to buy a home. But again, you would have to have a fictitious address already in place to qualify for this program, or am I missing something? I, I know what you're saying, yeah, if you bought a home, but but again, as I look look at the bill, the way it's written, or, or apparently I'm missing something, a person to whom the fictitious address has been issued pursuant to, and, and then this just expands who has to comply with that, that fictitious address. And, and the circumstances, um, clearly if you had one in your hand, yes and you bought a home, you could go to the assessor and say, here's, here's my affidavit, I've, I've been given the fictitious address, and therefore I want my records to be kept conf confidential, and uh, this bill would authorize that. Mandy Davis, for the record, that's, that's correct. This bill has nothing to do with their eligibility requirements or the process to apply for participation in the program. This would just allow those participants who choose to purchase a home to request that their information remain confidential. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Additional questions? 
Okay, seeing none. Uh, Ms. Pond, would you please spell your name so that we have it for the record, please? Erica Pond, for the record, um, it's E-R-I-K-A, P as in Peter, O, N as in Nancy, D as in dog. Thank you very much. All right, so with that, um, if we don't have any more questions from the committee, we will go to um, support opposition and neutral and broadcasting when you're ready. To testify in support of Assembly Bill 21, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Call with the last three digits of 211. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Joanna Jacob, J-O-A-N-N-A-J-A-C-O-B, Government Affairs Manager for Clark County. Uh, Madam Chair, I just wanted to put on the record today our comments in support of the bill. We did testify opposed in the assembly just for the purpose of working with Ms. Davis on um, some technical amendments that she mentioned in the assembly. As Senator Neal mentioned, this does touch many departments, um, but we are very pleased to be in support and want to thank uh, Ms. Davis for working with our county recorder, our assessor, and elections department on the amendment to this bill. So thank you. Thank you very much. Next caller, please. Caller, with the last three digits of 540, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Serena Evans, S-E-R-E-N-A-E-V-A-N-S, and I'm here on behalf of the Nevada Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence, and we are in support of Assembly Bill 21. After a victim survivor is fortunate enough to have the courage and support to leave an abusive relationship, they are still not promised safety. In fact, the time after a victim survivor has left is the most dangerous time for victim survivors, with the majority of the domestic violence homicides occurring after the victim survivor has left and ended their relationship. To protect themselves and their families, many victim survivors enroll in the confidential address program to create a sense of safety, knowing that their address is not public information for their abuser to find. And while the confidential address program provides victim survivors with that safety and comfort, having to apply for the program can be a daunting process and require quite a bit of the survivor's time. Having to then get an additional court order to maintain their privacy through public, public records with the county recorder's or assessor's office is another time-consuming burden that many victim survivors may not have the luxury of committing to. We support Assembly Bill 21 because allowing victim survivors to sign an affidavit rather than petitioning the courts to remove private information from public records is a step in the right direction of increasing survivor safety without putting a fur further burden onto survivors themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next caller, please. Chair, there are no more callers in opposition at this time. I believe we were on support and we're moving. I beg your pardon, Chair. There are no more callers in support at this time. Thank you, we'll move to opposition. To testify in opposition to Assembly Bill 21, Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you very much and we'll go to neutral. To testify in the neutral position on Assembly Bill 21, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller, with the last three digits of 490, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Dave Dolly. It's D-A-W-L-E-Y. 
I'm with the Nevada Assessors Association. We originally um, opposed this bill because we, um, the assessors are always looking for transparency in government. And we believe anytime you remove names from the tax roll itself, it causes um, a big problem. Um, I would like to thank uh, Chairman Flores and Ms. Davis because they did work with us on this bill with our concerns. There was at one point uh, an amendment to the bill which had a time period on it because this particular um, language or this particular program is only good for a four-year time period. And so we actually would like that, that addressed in here because it, it's not in there and the way it's written now, it's gonna be confidential forever. Um, you can actually, after that four-year time period, get an extension or another four-year time period. Um, but again, the way it's written right now, it's, it's gonna be permanent. So uh, we would request that that change be made. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I am hoping that you can work with the sponsors of the bill. Next caller, please. Sure, there are no more callers in the neutral position at this time. Thank you very much. And we'll go back to um, Ms. Davis and Ms. Pond and see if they have any closing comments. Um, thank you, Mandy Davis, for the record. Um, just thank you for letting us present the bill. Um, we'd be happy to you're very welcome, and we're happy to have you here, and thank you very much. And that uh, will close uh, Assembly Bill 21, the hearing on that bill, and we'll go to Assembly Bill 28, which imposes an inverse preference on certain bidders for state purchasing contracts. And Mr. Doty, will you please go ahead when you're ready? Good afternoon, Chair Dundara Loop and members of the committee. I am Kevin Doty, Administrator for State Purchasing. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present Assembly Bill 28 this afternoon. Uh, restoring Nevada's inverse preference law was recommended by the Executive Branch Audit Committee uh, at their February 2020 meeting. Uh, the idea is to try to award more state contracts to Nevada-based businesses. So it's, it's in line with the Nevada preference that was enacted by the Nevada legislature in 2017. Uh, I say restore Nevada's inverse preference law because this was previously in the law from 2003 to 2009. It was dropped from the law at the same time that the preference for a business owned by a disabled veteran was, was added to the law. And from the legislative history, it's not entirely clear why the inverse preference was dropped. There may have been some confusion as to what would happen if you were awarding a positive preference at the same time you were taking points away from an out-of-state vendor. So that might have been the reason why. Um, the way an inverse preference works is that it essentially penalizes out-of-state businesses if they are located in a state where they receive a preference. So the, uh, just, just to give one example, let's say we issue an RFP, a request for proposals for some type of service the state of Nevada needs. And there are four proposals submitted in response. Uh, one is from an Oregon-based uh, company where let's say Oregon gives their own businesses a 10% preference. Uh, one is from a Colorado-based company where let's say the state of Colorado gives a 5% preference to their home businesses. And one is from a Texas-based company that provides no preference. Uh, the final proposal is from a Nevada-based company. When Nevada-based company uh, already benefits from the 5% Nevada preference. So when we take the scores, uh, the evaluation committee comes up with when they score the RFPs and when we go to decide who to award the contract to, we would penalize the Oregon vendor by 10% because they receive a 10% preference in their home state. Now, penalize the Colorado-based vendor by 5% because they receive a 5% preference in their home state. Make no change to the score from the Texas-based uh, vendor. And the Nevada-based vendor would receive the Nevada preference of 5%, which is already uh, in our law. Now, theoretically, the applying this inverse preference should result in some co more contracts being awarded to Nevada-based businesses. It's, it's impossible to tell how many will be affected or which contracts or for which agencies. That's why there's no fiscal note attached to this bill, even though it, it is likely 
the, the application of the inverse preference will result in, in the state sometimes paying more by going with the Nevada-based vendor, uh, much as, as happens with our current Nevada preference. And, and, it's, and that's the explanation of our uh, Assembly Bill 28. Uh, thank you very much. Um, any questions? Senator Neal. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, and thank you for the explanation. But I guess, you know, when I, I had looked at this bill when it was on the other side, but in, I just, so let me ask the first question. This only applies when all things are equal, right? Meaning the 5% exists in Oregon or Texas or whatever, and then, okay, you're nodding yes. So, and then my yeah. second. Thank, thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead. No. Uh, thank go, you, Cynthia. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, for the record, <laughs> Kevin Doty, for the record. Um, yes, you are exactly right. We only apply, uh, we only penalize a, a, a business located in the state that, that gives its companies a preference. So, uh, right now, uh, Nevada based companies, since they receive a 5% preference here in, in Nevada, when a Nevada-based company goes to try to get work in California or Oregon or another state with an inverse preference law, and there are about 35 states that have this, this inverse preference law, the Nevada-based business is getting penalized 5%. So in a sense, by restoring our inverse preference law, it would, it would level the playing field in a sense. Thank you for that. And I guess the question that I was wondering is, how why why haven't these been challenged to violate like privileges and immunities like you're creating the preference the inverse preference but what what is your public policy purpose for the discrimination except for that you want to give preference you want to you want to disfavor your own but aren't there inherent inequality issues with that or have there even been any cases that challenge this under a pni issue Kevin Doty, for the record, thank you for that excellent question, Senator Neal. Uh, the uh, privileges and immunities issue is something that has come up in the only case I'm aware of is the, uh, the one involving Camden, New Jersey, that was decided by the United States Supreme Court in 1984. Uh, that was a case where the, uh, Camden enacted a municipal ordinance, ordinance which required any winner of a construction contract to hire at least 40 percent Camden uh, residents to uh, work on the contract. And that was struck down by the Supreme Court as a violation of the Privileges and Immunities Clause in Article 4 of the Constitution, uh, an eight to one decision. So I, I can see the, the basis for your, your concern. I'm not aware of any of the inverse preference laws or any of the existing preference laws being challenged in that way. And it may be because we're only talking 5%, 10%, uh, maybe vendors haven't thought to challenge them. They're not, you know, concerned enough with them to challenge. They don't change the result in a whole lot of contracts, but um, the privilege and immunities argument is there and has been made in a different context um, and for a more, you know, extreme, you know, 40 percent. But um, that is a valid point, Senator Neal. So, yeah, because, so thanks, Madam Chair. I just, I just want to know, like, when, when I look at Section 1, so, so let's say the, the business that wants to come and apply, yes, they had a preference, but the preference is no longer applicable. So how, how is that business then viewed when they want to come into Nevada? Do, what, what documents would you ask from business, you know, why? who wants to come in and say, okay, Texas has the 5% preference. You might have had the 5% preference in 2019 and 2020, but now you're trying to do work in 21. Are they then penalized because the state had it and then they had it prior? Kevin Doty, for the record, uh, thank you for the questions, Senator Neal. It's, it's based upon what the state's law is currently and and where the business's principal place of business is. Uh, that's the uh, the terminology used in our um, Nevada preference law 
And we interpret that in line with the Supreme Court decision and Hertz Corporation versus Friend, which has to do with um, jurisdiction over a corporation. A, a business has only one principal place of business. And so a, a business whose principal place of business is in, in Texas would be penalized if there is a preference for Texas businesses on the books at the time that we are out awarding our contract. If Texas has repealed that law, then we would no longer uh, impose that inverse preference. And it does impose a burden on state purchasing to uh, keep abreast of other states' uh, procurement laws and preferences. And uh, our, if this is enacted, we would uh, make changes to our e-procurement system and try to keep all that in there. So hopefully we could uh, streamline this a little bit. But that's how it would work. Okay, so thank you, Madam Chair. So do you think that, because this is, it's, it's not really hypothetical, but because of the pandemic, because of what has happened across borders, right, and businesses, number one, losing um, opportunities and then trying to go across jurisdictions in order to revive themselves, that this may then be ripe for a challenge because the environment is such that we're discriminating against out-of-state businesses to a, to, to a degree, but they have a legitimate reason for wanting to find work across borders. Kevin Doty, for the record, thank you for the question, Senator Neal. I think I mean, it, it's possible that a business could challenge an inverse preference law, just like it's possible that a business could challenge our existing Nevada preference law. Because our existing Nevada preference, we you know give a 5% bonus to Nevada companies when they bid on a, on a state contract. So it's always possible that a court challenge could be filed. Uh, I'm not aware of any case where any of the current preference laws or inverse preference laws have been held un unconstitutional. Thank you very much. Um, additional questions? Go ahead. You're probably thinking what I'm thinking. So, <laughs> so uh, I'm Mr. Doty. I'm uh, the part that I'm struggling with is under Section One B, where it says the other state re with respect to similar contracts awarded by that other state or agencies of that other state. So I, I see like other state like twice or three times. So are we just talking about the contracts in between? So if I come from Oregon to Nevada? Kevin Doty, for the record, I, I, I think I, I understand your question. Uh, the language in section one, subsection one, is basically how the law was written before, uh, from 2003 to 2009. That was the text that was uh, codified as NRS 333.336. Um, and it's written in that kind of weird way because not all preferences are, are alike. Some states will award a preference only to say uh, in-state printing businesses so if, say, Idaho is only awarding a 5% preference to a company that does printing work, we're only going to impose an, an inverse or reciprocal preference on a company that's bidding on printing work. It wouldn't be for all Idaho businesses. So it's just in, in proportion to whatever preference they're receiving in their home state. So, so merely having a preference that affects one industry doesn't mean that every business located in that state is subject to an inverse preference. So thank you. So how would one know what businesses, so if they don't award any printing contracts, how would I, how would one know that? Or how would one know that uh, they do Doody. award printing contracts? Uh, Kevin Doty, for the record, um, all, all these preferences we're talking about are, are part of state laws. So it's our uh, responsibility to, to check the laws of other states. And we are a member of the National Association of State Procurement Officials, which uh, NASPO tries to collect all these so that you can keep track of where the different preference laws are because they do change over time. And it would be 
uh, a requirement that we would keep up with that as they change. And of course, uh, vendors are usually savvy enough to make sure that we would not impose uh, a, a, an inverse preference where it wasn't suited. They would be willing to fight to make sure that we didn't dock their score 5% if in fact they, that wasn't a, a legitimate use of our inverse preference law. Thank you very much. Okay, additional questions, Senator Neal. Thank you, Madam Chair, for one more question. So I had a question on, uh, it's section one, but it's one, well, it's 2A. So the federal money provision, um, and I know it says uses federal money unless such preference is authorized by federal law, but, but do, what do we get into with that sentence in regards to, because typically federal law may or may not have number one preference or inverse preference, or they may have a prohibition. And so basically this is just saying like, if there's a prohibition in play, then you can't use federal money would not, it could not be a part of the award. What are we getting at with that federal money piece? Kevin Doty, for the record, thank you for the question, Senator Neal. Uh, this language comes directly from our Nevada preference law that was enacted in 2017, and you are absolutely correct. It is there to make sure that uh, we recognize the prohibition that currently exists in federal law uh, pursuant to 2 CFR section 200.319 subsection B. Uh, a, no geographical preference can be used when a contract is, is to, to expend federal funds unless the federal government specifically says we can do use a geographical preference or preferences in that specific instance. So this was written into the Nevada's preference law in 2017, and that language is copied here to make sure that we don't make that mistake on a contract involving federal money because uh, years later, federal auditors can show up and demand to have their money back, and we don't want to make that, that error. So can I ask you a hypothetical? Because I got to ask you a hypothetical question. So there's, there's, there's a couple bills. Like I know mine in particular, which was creating like the Office of Supplier Diversity, right? To really get into the game around procurement. Um, and so this inverse preference bill would then trigger a different relationship to those businesses, right? Because that bill is focused on diverse businesses, minority businesses. And so they may already have like a veteran, a disabled business clearly has something in statute now. And so if they mm -hmm. say, okay, I, I'm trying to play in the sandbox of the contract awards that are coming through, how, how are they hit then with this bill, this bill passes and the other one in terms of them, I guess, the, the equity issue of receiving too much of a preference because now you have the inverse bidder piece here and then we've kind of set out that there are goals and things that we should be striving for on the other end, right? Because there could be, there could be too much going on, right? Because they're going to be a local business and now we've put them in one pot and now we have inverse bidder functioning at the same time. I see that as a problem, you know. I'm not ever trying to, you know, it's about getting a foot in the door, but not but not the foot in the door to the point where you're like, well, it looks like I'm getting 25%, you know, like, like extra <laughs> extra points for just being. You know what I mean? Cuz then we get into a whole other challenge and issues. Kevin Doty, for the record, thank you uh, for that, uh, Senator Neal. There, there are two issues that come up here, actually. Uh, one is it is a policy determination for the legislature to make whether they want to be giving such a big preference in any given contract, because we will already be helping Nevada businesses out to the tune of 5%. And if we're also docking an out-of-state business 5 or, say, 10%, then you are correct. That would be a 15% swing which not only could result in the state paying, say, 15% more on, on a contract, uh, but I mean, may undermine other goals. And, and, and to that point, it is possible that an inverse preference could uh, discriminate against uh, minority-owned businesses 
in, located in other states. For example, California um, has various uh, preferences, some for minority-owned businesses, some for businesses that are small businesses, different things like that. And under an inverse preference law, those out-of-state businesses would be penalized to the same extent that they receive a benefit in their home state. So that is something to consider uh, from a policy perspective if the state that it could happen uh, if the inverse preference law is enacted. However, no Nevada-based business would ever be hurt by the inverse preference since it would only be used to harm or hurt the scores of out-of-state businesses. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you very much. Additional questions from the committee? Senator Gokachia. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and more of a comment than anything. I better put my mask on, I guess. Uh, uh, but uh, the bottom line is clearly those out-of-state companies don't pay taxes in the state, so you have to weigh that against the fact that that's really what this reverse preference is about. And yeah, you know, uh, especially in northern Nevada, eastern Nevada, we have a lot of Utah companies come in, and it, it you know, does impose a hardship on the on the locals. Uh, if this five percent, although it might cost the bidding entity a little more, it probably does provide more tax security for the state and those entities here. So. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. I, I I see where Miss Neal's coming from, and the fact that you could end up with 20 percent <laughs> uh, preference, and uh, that's going to be very profitable. But again, these companies tend to bid. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just always want the Nevada companies and the Nevada citizens to get the bid. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, without seeing any, I guess I don't see any additional questions. Uh, Mr. Doty, we'll go to support, opposition, and neutral. Thank you. Broadcasting when you're ready. To testify in support of Assembly Bill 28, Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in support at this time. Thank you very much. Please go to opposition. Star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you very much. We'll go to neutral. To testify in the neutral position on Assembly Bill 28, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in the neutral position at this time. Thank you very much. Uh, any closing comments, Mr. Doty? Kevin Doty, for the record, uh, thank you, Chair Dondero, for the opportunity to present Assembly Bill 28, and I have no further comments. Thank you very much, and thank you being, for being with us this Friday afternoon, late in the day. Appreciate your time. And uh, with that, I'll close the hearing on Assembly Bill 28, and we will go to the hearing on Assembly Bill 71. And Assembly Bill 71 will uh, revise its provisions relating to a certain information maintained by the Division of Natural Heritage of the State Department of Conservation. And we have Ms. Uh, Zebo, is that correct? Is that is am I that's saying correct. that? Am I saying that's that right? <laughs> Thank Absolutely. you very Kristen much. Zabo, yes. Thank you very much. Go ahead when you're ready, please. Um, good afternoon, uh, Chair Don Darrow Loop um, and members of the committee. With your permission, um, I'd like to go ahead and just do a little bit of an introduction um, with, before Kristen goes into the bill. Um, for the record, I'm Jim Lawrence, and I have the pleasure of serving as a deputy director for the Nevada Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Um, with me is Kristen Zabo, who is our administrator for the Natural Heritage Division. The Natural Heritage Division is one of the many divisions and programs within DCNR. A primary responsibility of the Natural Heritage Division is to maintain the state's database regarding rare or threatened species. And this is really critical information for planning purposes, educational purposes, scientific research. 
um, et cetera. Um, but it has been the practice of the Heritage Division when releasing this data to redact or maybe hide the specific location of where that rare plant or animal is located. Um, and that is obviously for the purposes of protecting that species um, or the site. This bill basically puts that practice in the statute. I wanna emphasize that this bill is really only about the specific location of these rare plants and animals. This is not about public records requests regarding emails or um, documentations or correspondence going back and forth. And I bring that up because this, this did come up in the first house. Um, and I think there were concerns raised largely because um, maybe the way the bill was drafted. Um, so we did work with um, some of the opposition in the first house to kind of clean that language up. We also worked very closely with the LCD legal folks to, to get the language right. Um, the bill also originally had a two thirds vote requirement because there was language regarding paying a reasonable fee. Um, we worked with LCD um, legal staff. We removed that language, it wasn't necessary. So the two thirds stamp is no longer on there. Um, and with that, I would really like to turn it over to Kristen Zabo, who is our administrator and, and um, runs the program and can give you really more of the specific details on this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Zabo. Go ahead when you're ready. Okay, thank you. Um, good, after, good afternoon, uh, Chair Dondera Loop and members of the committee. Again, I'm Kristen Zabo. I'm the administrator for the Nevada Division of Natural Heritage. And I'm pleased to be here to present Assembly Bill 71 which clarifies that the specific location data associated with rare plant or animal species or ecological communities is confidential, but can be released under certain circumstances. And before I walk through the sections of the bill, I'd just like to give you some background on the Division of Natural Heritage for context. Uh, the division's a non-regulatory agency whose mission is to develop and maintain a cost-effective centralized information source and inventory on the locations, biology, and conservation status of all imperiled plants and animals in Nevada. The division is a member of the NatureServe Network, an international network of natural heritage programs in the US, Canada, Latin America, and the Caribbean that provide the scientific basis for effective conservation action. The division manages data for hundreds of native plant and animal species that are listed as threatened or endangered or designated as candidates for listing as threatened or endangered under the Federal Endangered Species Act, considered sensitive by the US Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management, protected under state law, or considered rare or at risk of extinction by the Division of Natural Heritage. Our data are used by a variety of public and private entities early in the planning process to help minimize costly resource conflicts and to streamline federally mandated environmental reviews. The use of our data assists in quick, efficient, and informed land use planning and conservation planning decisions with the intention of striking a balance between economic development and species conservation. The division provides two levels of data to its users, the standard level of data and what we term data sensitive data. Examples of data sensitive data include location data that if released could result in poaching or collection threats, um, proprietary data, data that involve private land or a landowner that has requested confidentiality or locations of species or its habitat that is considered fragile. Data sensitive data are still provided to a requester. However, the precise locations are obscured, similar to redacting a person's address to protect their privacy. Um, standard data are provided to the customer without obscuring the location. And with that, I'd like to now provide a summary of Assembly Bill 71 in its first reprint. So section one, subsection two makes confidential the specific location of a rare plant or animal species or ecological community included in the division's data systems. Through the amendment process, the type of confidential data included was narrowed to apply only to the specific location information. This confidentiality does not apply to other public records such as emails, documents, or similar items typically associated with public records requests. Section one, subsection three, authorizes the administrator or designee to uh, release confidential location data to the public under certain circumstances and to private landowners without limitation. Confidential location data can be released if it, if it is not otherwise prohibited by law, is not restricted by the original provider, 
is made for an activity related to conservation, environmental review, education, land management, scientific research, or a similar purpose, is limited to the amount of information necessary to achieve the purpose of the request, and if the release is unlikely to harm the rare species or ecological community. This is the division's current standard practice, even though the confidentiality of the records is not yet formally recognized in statute. Um, section one, subsection four, requires a written agreement between the division and the requester that requires the requester to maintain confidentiality of the location data to protect the resource. This is also current standard practice within the division. Uh, subsection five references that the provisions of NRS chapter 239 apply to the release of any information. Section one, subsection seven defines the term rare plant or animal species or ecological community. And these are the federal, state, and division of natural heritage designations that I mentioned earlier in my testimony. Section two is a conforming change, that being the inclusion of NRS 232.1369 in the list of public records exemptions under NRS 239.010. Um, that concludes the summary of the bill in its first reprint. Um, if passed, I don't expect that this will change how we currently do business, but it will provide that extra level of protection for the data sensitive locations. As I mentioned earlier, when the division receives a data request that results in data sensitive locations, the data sensitive locations are obscured when providing the data to the client and the client is aware of this data limitation because they signed the division's data license agreement. However, the division may provide precise locations on a case-by-case -case basis. I'd also like to point out that through my counterparts at other natural heritage programs across the country, I've learned that the protection of data sensitive locations is a common challenge and many states have passed similar legislation to protect sensitive data. There are at least 23 states that have implemented similar data protections to varying degrees. And a list of these states and links to their statutes can be provided to the committee if needed. That concludes my testimony. Thanks for the opportunity to present Assembly Bill 71 and would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Uh, Senator Gorkachia, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I, I went through this bill with a very fine tooth comb after we had a conversation. And I guess one thing that really concerns me, if in if in the event where we had a rare plant, animal species, or ecological community, and it was on private property, I would hope that either in the regulations or if we can amend the bill, that private property owner should be notified before you release the information to anybody else. Uh, I would hope they would be get the information before you, in fact, had uh, other people of the community actually out there. And, and again, this would only be in the circumstance where that was actually private property and owned in those cases. Uh, the way this reads, you could release that information to uh, the environmental community and the person that owned the property would never know. It says you can, but if they didn't know and didn't know to request it, uh, I guess that, that really concerns me. If there is private property involved in it, then they should be notified first. So just uh, comment. Thank you, um, Senator Goykachia. This is Kristen Zabel for the record. Um, I do want to just point out that we do, when we we do have data on private land, that that data are obscured. Um, so when the data are released, um, the actual, the, you know, the specific location is not released. We don't currently have a practice of notify, notifying a private landowner each time that information comes up in a request. Um, we do about I don't know, 300 or more requests a year. So um, we'd have to figure out the best way to do that if we amended the bill to include that notification process. Uh, thank you. And, and again, the bill says the administrator may adopt uh, regulations necessary to carry out the provisions of this section, at least put it in regulation that said, hey, b before you release any of this information, if in fact, uh, this is going to impact a private landowner, they shall be no notified before you release it to, i.e., the env environmental community or or anyone else that requested. The re uh, I just think in all fairness, uh, 
that's a lot. You, I, it becomes a trespass issue, if nothing else. You say, okay, this is the location, and uh, maybe the guy that owns it doesn't even know they're there. Thank you, Senator. Um, Kristen's able for the record. Yes, thank you for those comments, and we'll definitely take all of that into account. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator, Vice Chair Orenshaw, please. Thank you very much, Chair. And I think uh, it's more of a comment than a question, but what I like about the bill is, uh, you know, in the last 10 years, prior to losing Assemblyman Harry Mortensen, he and his wife worked hard to try to get the Tule Springs Fossil Bed National Monument dedicated and the, and the Ice Age State Park. And I really fear that if, you know, they hadn't worked so hard to make that happen, that, you know, people who like to collect fossils for their private collections or to show off to their friends might have raided, you know, these treasures. And I think a bill like this could help, especially where there are areas that are sensitive, that maybe there, there's a there's working towards protection, and, uh, and there's a there's a long road to getting that protection, just like there was for Harry Mortensen and Helen Mortensen. But but it happened, and you know I think this bill could help try to prevent you know raiders who want to just uh, get those things for their private collections or to have in their home or show off to their friends. So thank you for the bill. Thank you very much. Additional questions. Senator Neal. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, so I have two questions. The first one is super simple. What are the rare animals that you have come across that we're, that we would be making confidential? Thank you for the question, Senator Neal. Kristen Zabo, for the record. Um, it's a very long list, so it could be a particular species that we consider sensitive. If it's um, listed as endangered, we would obscure the actual locations of an endangered species to protect it because it's listed on the Endangered Species Act. We also obscure data for particular habitat types. So for example, the nest of uh, an eagle, an eagle nest, hawk nest, falcon nests, um, bats, where bats uh, hibernate in caves and mines will protect those, those specific locations so that um, people don't enter those caves and mines looking for the bats because they're very uh, insensitive to disturbance. Um, certain species of plants, uh, cacti and yucca, um, that are uh, specifically targeted for poaching and collection. Um, so there's there's a lot of different examples, but the, those, are, those are a few. Thank you for that. And then my second question is, so how would this work? So like, I know in Lake Las Vegas, they have, it looks to me, I think they have like a ecological community or habitat of wolves or little baby wolves. And like, I mean, they've built out, but you can see them because they, you know, they'll howl at night or even in that little strip have you been to Lake Las Vegas? There's like a strip where they'll be sitting underneath the tree, <laughs> like on your way to the water. And so I'm, I always wondered, I know they built out, but how, how those, um, those wolves are being protected, or coyotes, or whatever, they might even be coyotes, how they're being protected in that environment, because we keep encroaching as we build. It's the same thing that's happening in Red Rock. Um, you know, you read that story where I think it was a mountain lion or something that came into the Red Rock area. Um, and then people are, they're more concerned about their pet, their pet getting eaten. But there's really another issue there about, well, you've just encroached in their habitat and now they don't have anywhere to go. And now they're just kind of roaming around because you probably dug up where they lived or moved there. Well, you changed their feeding pattern for sure because you basically messed up where they lived. How does this bill affect that? Thank you for that question, Kristen Zabo, for the record. So I'm pretty sure you're talking about coyotes and not wolves, I think, in Southern Nevada. There are records, potential records of wolves in Nevada, but that would be in more in the Northern part of the state. Um, coyotes and mountain lions are not considered rare or at risk according to our the natural heritage so um, so those we don't collect those data or keep those data in our 
in our database. So um, would probably be more a question for Department of Wildlife. Okay, well, good to know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, if I may, uh, Madam Chair, just sort of add on, because excellent question. Please, and state your name for the record. Thank you. I will. Thank you. Uh, Jim Lawrence, Deputy Director, Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Um, you know, while Administrator Zeba explained that, you know, in the case of coyotes, those aren't on, you know, rare or endangered lists, so we would release that data without obscuring any of it. But the um, the overall point is really, you know, one of the, the main importance of this heritage program is we do have many, many species of plants and animals that are rare or threatened and whose habitat might be on the fringes of where urban areas are looking to grow. And that's why it's very important to have this information and have this data, um, and then to be able to release the sensitive, most specific locations when local governments are, are doing their planning work um, so that we can avoid those locations and protect those species. Um, so I, I really do appreciate the question because it, it really does kind of hit at, at, at Part of the heart of the program so thank you thank you for that i i just i just in my because my friend lives out there and it's more of a joke because i keep telling him i hope the baby coyotes come over and eat his pup pup but <laughs> it's just because he he doesn't respect it he's just like oh whatever but i'm just kind of like those those little coyotes are going to come around in your backyard and eat your dog and then I'm gonna throw a party. But anyway, no animal rights people write me. I'm just joking. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, additional questions. I think we I think we've exhausted the questions or maybe the time as well. Um, is there anything else you would like to add um, as information to us? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I realize it's late on a Friday afternoon and we're in the spot of between you and your weekend or whatever work you need to do tonight. We don't have anything to add on this point, but we really appreciate the, the conversation. Thank you very much. You're actually between us and another meeting at six o'clock, so it's okay. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. We will go to um, support opposition and neutral. So just uh, hang for just a minute. We'll be with you. Uh, broadcasting when you're re ready, please. To testify in support of Assembly Bill 71, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in support at this time. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll go to neutral. Sorry, I meant uh, opposition. To testify in opposition to Assembly Bill 71, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you, and now we can go to neutral. Thank you. To testify in a neutral position on Assembly Bill 71, please press star nine now to take your place in a queue. Chair, there are no callers in a neutral position at this time. Thank you very much. And with that, uh, Mr. Lawrence or Ms. Zabo, do you have any closing comments? <laughs> Um, for the record, Jim Lawrence, um, no closing comments. I really appreciate your time and attention late on a Friday afternoon. Um, Senator Goykachia, certainly take note of the private landowner. Having private landowner participation in the database is essential. So really do um, take to heart those comments and, and all the comments from the committee. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate your time late on a Friday afternoon as well. And uh, hopefully you'll have a nice weekend. And thank you very much. And we will uh, close the hearing on Assembly Bill 71. And with that, uh, we have one more 
item on our agenda, and that is public comment. So um, when you are ready broadcasting, please go ahead. To take place in the public comment queue, please press star nine now. Chair, the public line is open and working, but there are no callers at this time. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And with no public comment, um, I will see all of you on Monday at 3.30. Thank you very much, staff, for hanging in there with us and uh, broadcasting. And with that, we'll adjourn.